I did want to say that we are really, really honored to have Shabnam Virmani with us today. Uh, we were just uh, figuring out when we met first. And uh, I told her we met in the 90s when she was primarily a filmmaker and not the person now associated with the Kabir project. Uh, so Bindu knows her in, a, in another avatar and I know her from uh, an earlier time. Before, yes. But, but she was, uh, she's as splendid an organizer and singer and curator of the Kabir project as she was a filmmaker. So uh, I think there's a continuity in the kind of qualities of engagement she brings to the work that she has taken up. So lovely to have you here, Shavnam. And I'm not going to stand between you and the audience, as I say. Uh, so Bindu, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, today, a special thanks to Shabnam for uh, really agreeing to be with us here. Um, Shabnam is very special to me in my life. Um, when I didn't even know what was coming my way, um, she was there to just take me on an adventure, literally. Um, in 2007, when I first went to her house and I heard her strumming the tamburi and I got so so smitten by the sound of that that I said um, where is this coming from I want to know more about this tamburi and she just said I'm going back to Lunia Kheri um, and if you want these are the dates come by and um, I was in Ahmedabad at that time studying at NID then I booked a train I got off at Maxi from there Shabnam and Pralaji came all the way to the station to pick me up early in the morning and on the way, fed me poha and chai. <laughs> and, uh, and then took me there. Malwa's famous poha. Poha and chai. And uh, Malwa's famous, I think, warmth of yeah. greeting anybody into your home. And uh, there it actually began. Although everything came back in a big way in 2012, the seeds of it, I didn't realize without me realizing we're getting sown there of spending those days with Prahlaji and Shabnam and uh, driving to these other places where they sang and driving back. Um, yeah. So I was just there witnessing all this, absorbing all this and uh, things were happening inside me after that. And when I didn't even know what was happening on what we wanted to do, Vedant and I wanted to do with our music and our deep thirst for something and this was a thirst which we didn't know how to answer that or quench it somehow uh, Shabnam in her quiet way uh, already started making things move and telling Gopal that maybe you should call these two and then being there as an advisor for both of us when there was we had no idea we had these songs recorded we didn't we didn't know what to do so I went and spoke to her she was the first one to give us that confidence that what we're doing is um, good and that we should not let go of our hope with Suno Bhai <laughs> as a piece of work. And my entire career changed in 2012. And uh, that's really largely, largely thanks to Shabnam um, connecting the dots, encouraging us to go and be part of so many other beautiful things that were birthing in that time. And if not for the already solid foundation that she was laying down with her love, her films, her Kabir project, um, everything was prepared. We, we just had to walk in. And uh, <laughs> that is Shabnam's work. And uh, so thank you, Shabnam. You'll always be that, that catalyst in my, in my life. And I didn't even know that was what you were doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. Over to you, Shabnam. That's actually one of the nicest, warmest introductions I've received in recent times. So thank you for that, Bindu. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to meet with uh, some people who have been learning and inquiring into Kabir with you. Uh, I was wondering uh, what to share today, and I hope what I share will hold some sparks for uh, all of you. I just uh, looked at the list of songs that you have shared with the students of these two batches, 
And two immediately grabbed me and I thought, let me speak about them in the light of recent work and thought done around them. And these are Haman Hai Ishq Mastana and Maya Mahathagini Hamjani. And uh, I'm also going to share with you some translations. Uh, you know, it's something I've been trying to sort of try my skills, hone my skills in translation. It's not something I've done really seriously before. Uh, doing subtitles in a film is, or translations on the fly when you sing is very different from doing poems as English translations that stand on their own. So I've been trying that. It's from an unpublished book on Kabir. Um, so I thought I'll just share uh, my translations and some thoughts around these two songs, if that's okay. And then we'll just open up, up to a conversation. And if there are other songs you want me to speak about, I'm happy to do that. Um, so Haman Hai Ishq Mastana, I don't need to share the lyrics of this. Now everybody is already very familiar, right? Haman ko hoshiyari kya, rehe azad ya jag me, haman dunya se yari kya. You notice I, I made se into me, rehe azad ya jag se, rehe azad ya jag me. Uh, there's a sort of a biggish shift that happens when you make that switch. And as an inheritor of the Kabir tradition, mm -hmm. inheritor of the oral traditions of Kabir, I am at liberty to make such shifts, right? Because we, none of us know what the authentic original Kabir is. So as a partaker of this tradition, I make such shifts um, when I sing. Um, as I have seen Prehlad Ji do and uh, so many other carriers of the tradition, because these meanings, as they begin to distill in your own consciousness and understanding and your lived reality, uh, you, you own the poem as much as the poet. Um, you are, uh, in a sense, a Sir Hiradaya of the poet. Uh, uh, the poet has the words, but you both have the same experience, in a sense. And you need the poet to give words for something you too have experienced, you know. So this is why uh, many people in the tradition will say, hum bhi kabir hain, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's in that spirit that I say, uh, rahe azad ya jag me haman dunya se yari kya. Jo bichhude hain piyare se bhatakte dar badar phirte, hamara yaar hai hum me haman ko intizari kya. So uh, I was... Uh, uh, creating a pedagogic tool the other day for a new innovation uh, program that we are trying to create called Shabbat Shala, which is to take this poetry to schools. And um, unfortunately, my laptop got stolen, so I don't have that uh, slideshow I created. But I'll tell you about what, what it did to for the students and for me. Uh, essentially, I wanted to investigate the idea of Azadi you know, azadi as in freedom, freedom struggles for freedom, uh, for independence. How would we translate the word azadi? And what is the azadi Kabir is, is, is showing us? And uh, essentially what I did was, uh, I asked the young students in the school to respond to just internet photos that I had downloaded. And I started with, and I told them, I said, you have to see, this is going to go from very obvious to subtle, uh, very clear to more complex. So it started with a bird in a cage and the students had to, you know, spot the Azadi or the Gulami that they see in the image in front of them. So obviously, bird in a cage, fine. And then there were images of transatlantic uh, black uh, slave trade people, humans in chains. Um, there were images of uh, the Indian freedom struggle uh, with the Indian sepoy mutiny and the British colonizers. Uh, and the students were spotting, discussing freedom and bondage. And there was an image of a man entering a 
sewer. And uh, the students were sharp enough to point that out as the gulami of caste. Um, that this is a manual scavenging done by only certain sections of Indian society. Uh, then there was an image of a joint family. And then things started getting more complex. So people spoke about bondage of women in the joint family, gulami of children in the joint family, patriarchal authority. Some said joint families give single women agency to work because if they have supportive family members, she's better off than a nuclear mm -hmm. uh, scenario. Uh, and like that, we moved on. There was a man standing outside a rich palatial bungalow with a couple of cars and financial freedom. Yes, Azadi. Uh, quickly, some people said, but this looks like this guy probably works from 8 a.m. in the morning to 8 at night to earn this kind of money. Uh, that's actually a lot of bondage. Then another person said, oh, but when he goes on holidays, he's worried if there'll be a break in. That's another kind of bondage. Um, so um, things started getting more complex. Um, then there was an image of Shah Rukh Khan posing with all his girl fans thronging around him. So there was a big discussion about Azadi. Uh, uh, how uh, fame and fortune and all of that can give you Azadi. You can walk into places, doors open for you. Uh, but you are also slave to your own self image. Uh, in fact, I think Shah Rukh Khan himself has said in an interview that he works in uh, the daftar of his self image. He's, he's a peon in the, <laughs> in the office of his self image. Uh, so, so that's a kind of bondage. Uh, then there were images of social media, uh, people glued to their gadgets. There was an image of uh, somebody smoking and looking really cool, freedom and bondage uh, of addictions, uh, youth, beauty, uh, self image, and I think it ended with an image of someone uh, evidently depressed, uh, struggling with, with the bondage that your own mental thought patterns can create. Um, you could be, I mean, actually this derives from a very interesting image from a Shah Latif Dastan called Umar Marui, where uh, Umar is this king who falls in love with this simple Rabadi girl called Marui, abducts her, brings her to his palace and uh, uh, asks her to be his chief queen. And she refuses and she says she wants to go back to where she came from, Malir, her homeland. And he is enraged and he, uh, he imprisons her in his fort for decades. And she does not relent. She insists she wants to go back home. Now, interestingly, this metaphor, as uh, all Sufi tropes, can be read at multiple levels of ishke, mizaji, ishke, hakiki. And uh, there is a zahir, which is that surfacial or uh, earthly or worldly uh, meaning that presents itself to you in a romantic tale or a patriotic tale even. Uh, I mean, it's evident the story gets uh, appropriated in very patriotic ways by Sindhi communities, mm, very patriarchal ways as well, uh, because she retained her chastity and then she went back and there was a chastity test and all of that. But there are other ways to read this tale. And uh, Umar is in, a, in, a, in the Sufi understanding of this tale, Umar is Marui's own mind. Marui's own nafs, Marui's own ego nafs, her small mind, okay? We are not denigrating mind mind, we are denigrating the uh, self-cherishing mind. So um, she is held bondage by her own small mind, her own ego. And that's what the whole uh, image is. The fortress is the body, the umar is her, um, her nafs, and she is the Ru or the soul that is seeking to return to an original promise made to Rab, 
that you are my true beloved. Anyway, I won't go there. We've uh, moved too far afield from Haman Hesh Mastana. So anyway, what I'm saying is that this, this exercise really opened up uh, the spectrum of outer and inner freedoms that a Bhakta or a Sufi will point us to and alert us to the fact that there are slippages, there are things we hanker for, we crave, that give uh, agency, autonomy, expression. And then subtly, subtly, before we even know it, they've become our shackles. And that slippage that happens between things that uh, mobilize us to things that uh, diminish us or bring us, uh, limit, delimit us, is that subtle self-awareness that the Sufi or the Bhakta or Kabir will invite us to investigate. So um, in a sense, I thought I was doing this for the kids in a school. And then it's remarkable how this exercise stayed with me for weeks after we did it. Because I found myself in every moment becoming acutely aware of, of things that are actually tying me down. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that was just one thing I wanted to share about Haman hai ishq mastana, Haman ko hoshi yari kya. And uh, I mean, we could talk about so many other things in that song, but I'll just stick to this one, one idea. And I will uh, link it now with this other song that you have all learned, Maya Mahathagini Hamjani. Uh, because the slippage or the trickster nature of the mind is also signaled here in this song, with a song like Maya Mahathagini Hamjani. So uh, just let's go over the lyrics again. Maya Mahathagini Hamjani, Tirguna Fans Liye Kar Dole, Bole Madhuri Bani, Keshav Ke Kamlahui Bethi, Shiv Ke Bhavan Bhavani, Panda Ke Murat Hui Bethi, Tirat Me Bhai Pani, Yogi Ke Yogin Hui Bethi, Raja Ke Gharani, Kahu Ke Hira Hui Bethi, Kahu ke kauri kani. Bhaktan ke bhaktin hui bethi. Brahma ke brahmani. Kahe kavir suno bhai sadho. Ye sab akat kahani. So I had great fun translating this uh, recently for my hopefully upcoming book. I know her now, Kavir says. I know her now. Miss Delusion. She's a smooth operator. Twirling a noose of three qualities, she sidles up, whispering sweet nothings in your ear. For Vishnu, she becomes Lakshmi. For Shiva, she's Parvati. For a temple priest, she's the idol. For pilgrims taking a holy dip, she's water. For the yogi, she is yogin. In a king's palace, the queen, she's a sparkling jewel for some, a glittering penny for a beggar. For a male devotee, she's the female devotee. For Brahma, she's his lady friend. Says Kabir, listen, my friends, this tale is untellable. So uh, let us squarely recognize the extremely sexist <laughs> metaphor presented here by yours truly, Kabir. Um, and I had fun doing, uh, doing this too, you know, it's like Kabir ke liye mm, uh, Maya is a Dakan, a witch. She's a Mohini, she's a seductress. She is, uh, yeah, she's all these She's like a mole <laughs> uh, trying to sort of secretly exert control on, you know, that boss. I don't know if people of my generation will recognize Ajit and his Mona darling. So in a sense, Maya is that mole and uh, the boss is the boss mind, right? Our rational mind, 
you know, we think we're in control. But behind closed bedroom doors, you know, we are actually just eating out of the hands of this mm, seductress, Maya. Uh, I've played with the gender in my translations. I've, I've made Maya also this really gorgeous guy who's irresistible. So I think the, the, the core idea that Kabir is presenting to us here is that there is no seduction quite like delusion. He's pointing us to the idea that we get seduced, you know, there are short term rewards that make us kind of blind. We, we choose to overlook certain ideas or facts. We elide, we ellipse, and then we create a delusion, which we come to believe in because it is so gratifying in the short run. These, uh, these ideas of permanence or eternal love or uh, selfhood, these are all uh, delusions. Uh, these are all figments that we want to believe in because it gives us this warm feeling in our heart. It gives us a sense of security. It makes us not confront certain truths or realities like death or uh, you know, you're not really as nice as you think you are, or <laughs> there are ways in which we rationalize, we elide, we ellipse reality. So this is the nature of Maya, something that deludes us, holding out a very irresistible promise of some kind, but something that always, always fails to deliver. And Maya is also, uh, Prakriti, all forms of Prakriti in a sense. Anyway, we'll get into that a little later. I'll just share a few more ideas around Maya. So Kabir says, Maya sam nahi mohini, man saman nahi chor, harijan sam nahi parkhi, koi nadi se or. There is no seductress, quite like delusion, no thief like a roving mind, only seekers manage to nab them, all the others are blind. Maya, no, Kabir Maya Mohini Mohe Jan Sujan. Bhage hu chute nahi, bhari bhari mare baan. Fallacy is a farm fatal. She seduces all men, even the wise. They scramble but cannot escape being nailed by her arrows strike. And here I played with the gender with an option, if we want to go with that one. Fallacy is a dangerous rake. He seduces everyone, even the sage. They scramble but cannot escape being nailed mm -hmm. by his arrows blade. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Prehladji se maine ye bhot sundar doha suna on Maya, which was so starkly and deceptively simple, it almost eludes grasp. It says, Maya Maya sab koi kahe, Maya na chin hai koi. Jo man se na utre, Maya kaha be soi. Maya Maya they all say, but no one really gets this. Whatever is gripping your mind right now, that's what Maya is. So, wow. What does that mean? Whatever is gripping your mind. Jo man se na utre wo Maya kaha ve soi. That actually brings almost 97% of your reality into the net of Maya. Right? Because there's always something gripping your mind. So, you know, uh, I think Kabir pushes us in the direction of realizing mm, that whatever's gripping your mind implies some kind of uh, say kernel origin, the buds of attachment. Because if something's gripping your mind, you're kind of getting invested, right? whether it's your next job opportunity or a lover or 
your uh, your situation, whatever it is that's gripping your mind. Uh, and Kabir is pushing us to realize that at the very core, all attachment, not just Kabir, Buddhism, all spiritual traditions actually, all attachment is at its core delusion because nothing lasts, nothing is permanent, and therefore all attachment is false. Also, because the self is a false construct, we have created this idea of I, which is linked with the idea of attachment, which is linked with the idea of ownership. I own this. Since both are false ideas or false entities, this solid self that you think you are, and this thing that you think out there is permanent and can be grasped and owned by you, the entire formula is false. It's deluded. So Kabir will, will bring you to this place of subtle, subtle, ever present, ever moment awareness that the moment you start getting entangled, the red flag comes up and he's telling you some delusion is creeping in right here. Because, and it's really interesting, he, he is not saying that the world is unreal. You know, this common parlance of, oh, sub maya hai, sub mithya hai, and therefore you can be uncaring, unregardful, unreverent to reality, relationships, people, the environment. No, this is not what this is all leading to. What it's leading to is a recognition of not so much that all forms around us are Maya as in they are illusion, no. It is leading to the understanding that they are not dependable. They are, but they are fluid. They are constantly forming and dissolving. And it is our grasping instinct, the assumption that these things are permanent, that is Maya. So Kabir says, Man te Maya upaje, Maya tirgun roop, Panch tatva ke mele me, Bandhe sakal sarup. Maya is born in the mind when five elements become one with creative, active, and passive qualities. All shapes and forms are spun. So in a sense, everything is in the net of Maya. Everything is evolving, dissolving, forming, unforming. And Kabir will keep you alert don't, don't, don't fall for this. Don't start hankering for this because it's really not even there. So he says, how will you, so he's never rejecting Maya. He's telling you to work with her, make her your slave. And how will you make her your slave? Instead of you eating out of your, her hands, how will she eat out of your hands or he? So he says, Kabir Maya Mohini Mange Mile Nahat. As long as you're mangoing, as long as you're hankering for it, grasping, trying to control, pin it down, she's going to constantly elude you because she's changing. Man utari juti kare, tab lagi dole saath. So he says, Maya is a coquette, says Kabir. Sorry. Sorry, sexist images, but let's, let's stick with the idea of seduction. Maya is a coquette, says Kabir. If you want her, she turns stale. But the very moment you turn away, she's hot on your trail. So that is how this phenomenal reality becomes, comes into the palm of your hand, in a sense. Maya Chaya. Ekasi birla jane koi bhagat ke piche lage sanmukh bhage soi. So Maya 
and Chaya Kabir Singh. Maya and your own shadow. Few can see their mates. Turn away and they will follow you. Give chase, they evade. So, uh, I think uh, I'm going to stop here. Uh, these are just two, two small ideas around the songs you have learned that I felt were, were, that have been sort of sparkling for me, glowing and opening up new meanings for my life in recent times. And I thought, let me share with you uh, these little epiphanies for what they are worth. And uh, I'd love to hear any questions, something, anything. You, you can respond to the ideas of Azadi and Maya that I have shared. On the other hand, you could ask me a question about any one of the other songs you've learned that's gripping you, that's, that's really important for you in your life. And I think always, always keeping that lens of lived experience when we approach these songs and this poetry uh, makes it vibrant, meaningful. So really any question is welcome. I think uh, Bindu, you are on mute and I see two participants have raised their hands. Should you want me to manage this? I think Sonia uh, can go first. Oh, hey, I recognize Sonia. Hi. Hi, it's such a delight to see you. <laughs> a warm hug to you, actually. Thank a you. Virtual hug to you. And uh, I like uh, the stanza and the topic that you have picked up about the attachment and the delusion. Okay. It was like uh, like a guru coming and talking to me. Something that I want to delve on. Okay. And uh, would you speak about uh, some more verses or stanzas from Kabir Wani, which actually talks about how to um, how to handle this uh, Maya um, in in a good way, rather than you know, it's okay to to hear that yes, Maya is delusional and it will it will chase you. But are there any other songs or bhajans uh, that can give more uh, practical guidance to a listener? Yeah, uh, Sonia, I I'll share with you a couple of more sakhis and one more poem. I don't know if uh, uh, I can say they will give you practical guidance, but really it's for us to, uh, I think, uh, cultivate uh, the quality of self-interrogation. I think that's the only tool for us to uh, work with, which is honesty in confronting the self and not believing the hubris that your small mind is going to give you or dish up. Uh, so Kabir says, Moti maya sab taje, jheeni taje na koi, peer pegambar oliya, jheeni sab ko khai. Everyone sheds gross attachments. The subtle are shed by none. Peers and fakirs, sages and seers, by the subtle come undone. So I think Jina, Jini, Avaz, Jini, Chadariya, Jini, Surta, which is awareness. This is a very, very big uh, call in Kabir. And I think it's particularly, or also, I guess it was particularly relevant in in his time too, in historical time, which is why he wrote these things or spoke them. Uh, but we all feel our times feel particularly gross and particularly flat-footedly dualistic. And Kabir's 
poems will keep saying, no, but it's really Jina. You have to get subtle in your awareness. So Kabir is saying, it's very easy to give up your obvious attachments. You see them in a big way and you can exert that will. But it's like this coming in through the back door kind of attachments uh, that derail your life. That self-awareness, only you can, uh, can bring that, that gaze upon the self. Nobody else can do it for you. Jini maya jinta ji moti gai bilai aise jan ke nikat se sab dukh gai hirai. Shed the subtle attachment. The obvious will shed themselves. Those who achieve such a feat are freed of all torment. In another beautiful poem, Kabir says, this is not a bhajan, this is something I actually read from a textual source tradition. Avadhu maya tajina ai, girha taj ke bastar bandha, bastar taj ke pheri, ladka taji ke chelha ki na tahu mat maya gheri. Jaise bel baag mein urj hai, mahi rahi urj hai, chhod, chhod, छोड़े सेवा छूटे नाही कोटिन करे उपाई काम तजे ते क्रोध न जाई क्रोध तजे ते लोभा लोभ तजे अहंकार न जाई मान बद बढ़ाई शोभा मन बहरागी माया त्यागी शब्द में सूरत समाई कहे कबीर सुनो भाई साधो ये गम बिरले पाई सो आई कॉल दिस पोएम ड्रॉपिंग डिल्यूजन Hey, wandering seeker, dropping delusion is tough. You left home, took the robes of a sage, then shed them to be a pauper. You left your son, but clung to your pupil. The net of delusion closed in. The, gr the garden wine that ensnared your foot in your home. Now you've taken to the road, right? is creeping all over your path. You flailed a lot, but were hopelessly caught, tangled in a vice-like grip. You gave up lust, but your anger didn't go. You gave up anger, not greed. When greed was gone, ego arose. You were caught in self-glory. When the mind lets go of grasping itself, that's when delusion is gone. Ad absorbed in the word, says Kabir, this way is only taken by some. So, Sonia, there is no shortcut. And we're all struggling in our, each in our own ways. Yes. So, if it's some solace, you're not alone. Uh, thank you so you're much. Thank you so much. And also uh, kind of creating an accountability for the self that uh, just reading uh, Kabir or reading Sufi is not uh, going to do anything. Yeah. It may be very pleasing to the ears or whatever that I, you know, I'm attending this. Absolutely. But, uh, very true. I'm, I'm grateful uh, because of the word that you used initially, that is a sir there. So I'm, no, grateful. I'm grateful that these words have been, uh, have been treasured and they are being passed on by people like you and Bindu. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, uh, Shabna, yeah. sorry. Yes, yes Bindu. There's that once, um, one more question in the chat window that uh, Elisha has just posted. Um, and then we can take Sunanda and Bhavani's question also after that. But I okay. thought this was from Kaylin, who was part of. Um, this uh, the previous group and today unfortunately she is um, unable to attend she's really looking forward to this so this question she wrote for you okay this question in an interview with Kapil Tiwari he talks about how Kabir is necessary to restore the spiritual component she's talking about one of your films the spiritual experience to our seeking I started is that the one am I reading the right one Bindu? yes yes, yes. 
I started with reading Kabir and it definitely inspired, energized and struck my heart. But reading seems to wane over time. I have found that singing Kabir has renewed the fire. Do you find that singing Kabir is more of the experience, the practice that deepens and gives life to the journey? Yes. Uh, Kaylin, most certainly. Uh, I think uh, your question goes to the heart of my own uh, journey, which is uh, of, in a sense, becoming Lattu on song and on singing. And I have tried to understand why. Uh, and I think uh, why the orality of a song, uh, the orality of a poem makes it that much more powerful. You say it yeah, renewed the fire, right? I think it's because um, singing is uh, mm, at the most obvious level, singing is uh, a, an experience that takes you beyond the intellect, beyond the discursive, um, hair splitting mind. Uh, it mobilizes the entire body. Um, it mobilizes the body, the heart, and the intellect, all in one go. Because sound at its core is vibration. And at some core level of our own uh, atomic existence, we are vibration. So sound has the capacity to create this sa, sa hirdaya consonance. There is a vibration that is seeking to energize a vibration which is our very being. Uh, the dhun, why does that is a mystery and it's a beautiful mystery, but why does a dhun pierce into your heart the way it does? We all know this. Your heart can melt and 20 books and 20 pravachans by your Guruji will not do what one heart, one song can do, which is dissolve you completely. You know, you're, you're a puddle on the ground and it's, it's gripped you for wordlessly, namelessly gripped you for weeks or months and it's done something. You don't know what's happening and that's good. Because when we bring experience into the realm of language, we diminish it. That's why Kabir keeps saying, Akat Kahani. Of course, he's using words to evoke it, right? That's the beautiful irony, because words are all we have. But he is inviting us to use the word, capital W word, sound, as a bridge to another reality, as a bridge to another state of being or experience. So the dhun does that, the, the heart is mobilized. And the words are mobilizing your intellect, the, the, the language of the poem. It's not Drupad Sangeet. It is saying something. It is one sadhaka reaching out, calling out in pukar, in sa hirdaya pan, in the spirit of sanghaship, it is one seeker calling out to another, saying, hey, Sadho, listen, I have something to share with you. So in a sense, the experience is something that is uh, like exponentially more transformative, potentially transformative and visceral than reading a text on a piece of paper. Um, so I'll just say that much for now. There are many other things to be said about the experience of singing, but otherwise we'll go on and on. There are so many hands raised, uh, eager I'm to sorry, hear. sorry, but there were two other questions before I posted the question by Kaylin in the chat box. Yes, right. but can we also ask Bhavani and Sunanda and come back to that? Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you, Shakti. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you. That was so very, so very insightful to hear you and it makes us want to delve even more deeper. Uh, I wanted to, uh, okay, so one is at the individual level when we are, you know, trying to understand and uh, get this insight and all. I would also like to uh, hear from you about, you know, 
given this uh, no, the relevance of can you speak a little louder i'm sorry my laptop speakers are really uh, soft so i'm really leaning in to hear you just speak a little louder please okay no the relevance of uh, you know kabir in today's times in terms of like you know the, your film on had anhad and the very you know practical uh, injunctions that you know we get from him talking about caste and the, you know the uh, inter the religion the divides that you know the man made divides yeah. and i think particularly the school project that you've thought of how do you think we can reach this out this thinking at a larger level you know how do we take it forward and could you know communities like us who are now uh, you know we've had this opportunity to take part in this course and how can we carry it forward yeah so um um bhavani thank you for that question and uh, uh it is a uh, very much a response uh, to the times we are in and in some ways that was the one of the source core inspirations for shabad shala and to take poetry to young minds in schools on a fairly uh, as large a scale as we can possibly do uh but having said that i want to uh, qualify with a kind of a statutory warning which is that the moment we begin to feel like we are on a mission instrumentalizing the poetry in favor of a cause the moment we get the slightest feeling that other people need to hear this more than me myself there is some thing for us to alert ourselves to and i see you nodding so i think you're on the same page with me but let's let's say this uh in working with teachers also uh i'm very conscious and clear that at no point the teacher feels she knows and the child needs to learn in fact if at all the child knows these truths far better than the baggage carrying adults who are teaching it to these children you know so i realized that in shabad shala we are delivering in a sense or creating spaces for this poetry to reach out not only to young children's minds but to their parents to the teachers to the communities from whom they come so uh, what we say is aap bachcho ki chinta chhod dijiye aapko chot lagi hai ki nahi do you see the value of this for yourself because you are not doodh mein dhula you are part of the problem if you have the assumption that you are not part of the problem then let's start there that's where the work needs to begin so pehle chot aapko lage and then like a flower that blooms you know in the bowl tradition this there is this beautiful image of the lotus that is that blooms when there is understanding when there is enlightenment there is a hriday komal that begins to bloom of its own accord and the fragrance of that will do its work so let us not instrumentalize the poetry let's not make it let's not you know say let's teach caste and religious harmony through kabir's poetry uh that's a dangerous route to take Sunanda Yeah hi um Chabnam ji firstly would like to say um I'm a big fan and I've never used the word fan earlier uh, just two three uh, months back I have uh, discovered Matkar Maya the song and I'm not a singer but I sing it with great gust so and uh, uh, you know uh, I'm not here today I'm not going to ask any questions uh, I just want to uh, say a few things from the uh, from what videos were shared uh, that really you know uh, further help uh, so you know lines like when uh, Vinay Hardikar says that you have to uh, have experienced sorrow to before you sing uh, any nirgun bhajan. Yes. and um, you know so there were there uh, so the uh, like pratiksha sharma or like how vidya rao vidya rao says that uh, 
um, you know, uh, the guru and the chela are not separate people. And uh, there are, there are, uh, there, there were junctions, you know, at point, there were junctions in life when uh, there is, you know, when you, when you're faced with two paths and you have to take decisions, not just for yourself, but which would affect others. And these, these songs were discovered at that point. So it's been very, uh, you know, poignant and it's reinforced when I see your uh, videos, you know, uh, it's that it's not just me. Every song at some point has touched somebody and you feel it's yours. And, you know, um, you know, uh, so and, and one especially like when, uh, of course, Prahlad Ji is the hero, uh, but, uh, um, you know, what his wife says when like, uh, unke um, um, maro bhi hak hai. Unke ye, you know, uh, unke kamai mein. I mean, it is, and just in an interview when she's making rotis and she's, you know, so innocent and so matter of factly, I feel she has achieved so much more. And that, that itself was such an opening uh, for me. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> these were what my takeaways were. And uh, thank you, the university, Ahmedabad University and Bindu for just taking it right into the heart. <laughs> Thank you. Shanda. Thank you so much, Sunanda, for these, this really heartfelt sharing. Thank you very much. I, I, I relate and resonate with everything that you have shared. Uh, uh, to me, in a curious sense, I have to share this with all of you. Uh, these four films on Kabir, uh, I feel in a sense are my gurus. I find that I keep returning to these film, films and now the films have been out in the public domain for almost 13 years. And I find I keep returning to these films and finding new meanings in, in what has been expressed in them. Uh, and I think it's a measure of the depth of this poetry that it unfolds newer and newer layers to you as you grow, as your life experiences show you newer and newer facets of life and living and loss and uh, new uh, meanings keep opening up. And uh, in a sense, these films also uh, journeyed with such uh, authentic seekers of Kabir. Honesty, yeah. Who are all struggling in their own ways to walk the talk. Nobody is an arrived soul there. Everybody is making mistakes, including Prahlad Ji. Uh, and you see the mistakes he's making. And you see the integrity with which he struggles with it, the checks and balances on him that, that uh, Shanti Ji provides yeah. uh, uh, at various moments in his journey. So it's very moving to see this trembling core of the frail human ego struggling with what Sonia was saying. How do we, how do we, how do we free ourselves of these delusions, the, the, the mayas? And we see them gripping everybody, even in the films. Everybody giving yarn is also somewhere struck by Maya. And you see that. So, uh, yeah, thank you for sharing. Thank you. Aruna? Hello. Um, well, it's so difficult for me to speak without getting overwhelmed. I saw the had done had, and uh, I'm an artist. I I dance, and uh, that's my language to ponder upon small and big things. Where I think the first thing it is an experience. That is why you're doing something which you do on a daily basis. Which for me is dance, poetry, and music. But it is also an expression. So how to not lose wonderment when you're going to be repeating it as part of both an internal practice as well as it forms your profession. You're supposed to be more empathetic. You're supposed to be... More what? More emp empathetic, more 
melting and more in the zone always but there are days you don't and how to not lose wonderment how do you keep your wonderment when you are that's such a good question that's such a good question karuna and in fact i will offer some thoughts but i would like to ask bindu to respond to that question too as a practitioner as a singer as an artist uh i think this is a really important question and i think uh it is in the nature of uh professionalization it is in the nature of the faster pace of our modern living conditions that we can fly to one place perform and then next morning fly to another place perform and then within a week you you've done as i've often seen prela ji also do five performances in one week how do you not become mechanical and uh, one part of me feels uh, there is no other way to do that except by performing less uh by not allowing uh that kind of uh knee jerk the other part of me feels that you need to bring a lot more rigor and courage and risk taking when you perform because that's the other thing that happens there is a lot of pressure on you and from the audience and the context and the organizers to keep delivering old songs old moments revisiting stale which have become stale in a sense see one can revisit old friendships and refresh them but if your friend starts sitting in your lap you're going to get a bit irritated so there has to be space and when i'm saying old friends i'm actually meaning songs here because kumar gandharv used to say this to his audiences who would keep asking for farmaishes he would say ha ha mai janta hu aapko bade purane doston se milwana hai lekin mai kuch naye dost bhi laya hu aapse milwane ke liye you know that's the image he used to use and i find it lovely i i love this image for songs because they are like friendships because they reveal new things to you and they they walk with you they journey with you these songs there is the flush of uh, infatuation even when you make a new friendship you know wo sir pe chadh jata hai ek gana there is an infatuation with with some songs and then okay ghar ki murghi dal barabar till you rediscover the beauty of that which is sitting in your house and you've kind of taken it for granted those are really magical moments when you revivify an old friendship with a song and what makes that happen i think it happens when uh an authentically lived experience comes together with that poem and you are able to refresh that poem with with a fresh insight or a fresh feeling um and you can truly be in it with that sense of wonderment that you are you know wonderment comes when you are when the the meaning of that song is hitting you afresh now then you are going ah oh, oh my god so uh i don't know it's a difficult question to answer uh i'll end with one last thought and then i'll ask bindu also to say what she feels i uh sometimes feel that uh in professionalized performance cultures wonderment is a beautiful value it gets a uh, short shifted by its lesser cousin and its lesser cousin is mm, how should i put it uh diversity entertainment scintillating uh, improvisation da 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 okay you know like new stuff dazzling audiences with with new things okay i want to i'm saying this because this counters what i was saying earlier okay 
sometimes repeating and repeating with deeper and deeper and deeper depths uncovers jewels and wonderment and feeling like newness, novelty, uh, new dost, don't. So revisiting old, old songs, old routines mm -hmm. can sometimes actually, you know, go much deeper. It's, it's like what I feel often is the power of folk music is often it's unvarying, repetitive, jump type quality. If we are moving away from expression and performance, and we are moving in the direction of remembrance, we're moving in the direction of japa, where you repeat, you're not about you're not improvising, you're not doing something new, you're not engaging or offering anything new, you're actually repeating. And I think that's the heart and the power of folk music where there is no hurry or no desire for freshness or newness in a curious opposite sense. There is a settling into the sameness, a settling deeper into a repetitive framework, which is actually sometimes much more meaningful. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um. Thanks, Karuna, because it, it made me think too. Am I loud enough for you to uh, hear me, Shabnam? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a very interesting question. It, it's making me think about what is it? Um, how does this wonderment uh, play a role? I, I have to confess, I have to acknowledge that it plays an extremely key role for um, a quick check. like. It's a moment to moment check of what's happening in my mind or how am I relating to what I'm doing? Um, because um, like she said, I, my answers are somewhere in the same space as what Shabnam has said, that the minute something becomes mechanical or boring, um, I it alerts me to say, where is my mind going or what am I getting into? And uh, what is the value or purpose of what I'm doing now for me? It could be the same thing that I was doing yesterday, but if today I'm feeling bored with it, it's showing me some other aspect of me. It could even be that I'm just way too preoccupied with something else, that I'm not present to what it is, what is happening or what this song is offering. I'm not being alert and awake enough to it at that point. That's very so, true. Um, so it's a check. I just immediately like become like, oh my God, uh, let me uh, see what happens. Or as I'm singing, I can see this is dawning on me. And sometimes, maybe that day I'm very tired, let's say, I take deep rest in the familiarity and let the song do what it will anyway do. So sometimes that familiarity is a resting space for me. And sometimes I was going to say the same thing Shabnam said that repeating it, repeating it again and again after a point breaks the mechanical and somehow opens the next space available there. Yeah. There's the next in-between vibration that starts revealing itself right and uh, the fun begins there and um, that is I have huge problems with riyas but I am improving a lot I can say but that riyas space happens and something new starts revealing itself and what I do is I play tricks to fool my mind after a point I realize I have to be a little ahead of my mind sometimes uh, and uh, I re-enter into the same space or same song from a different door. And um, that's how I broke my fear or whatever was blocking me from my own music 
I realized I ran from the familiar to the unfamiliar to re-enter back into the familiar. From Karnataka, when I ran to Hindustani, it was to just break things that I had constructed. Similarly, uh, if I have to sing a song and after a point, I will just pick another instrument or another something or change the tune completely and uh, make it come alive for the here and now, then and there, so that I am playing with it differently. So these are certain real tools that I'm talking about, actually. And from the outside world, um, the, the trap of the image is something which scares me. So I, I realize many people, and it, somehow there's a compulsion to always classify everything, especially artists, especially what you do. Uh, if I'm a singer, I'm not just a singer. If I'm an artist, I'm not just an artist. I need to be a particular somebody. Um, so a Carnatic musician wants to say I'm a Hindustani classical singer. A Hindustani classical singer wants to say I'm a light classical singer. Something goes on. So some people have said she's a Sufi singer. She's a Kabir singer. The minute I hear something like that, I really get very scared. Because then it tells me, am I getting repetitive even for myself and I'm not realizing it. Um, so the minute I was called Kabir singer, the next year itself, I sang only Tamil songs. Um, so uh, there are cues from inside and outside, which are uh, telling me that and at the same time, like Shabnam said, sometimes I declare saying today I want to really share some new things that are exciting me. Or sometimes I declare saying I'm still haunted by this song. I'm not over it yet. I'm still hungry for it. Um, so and yeah, when I know I move to tears or I'm dancing, that's a real cue that I have. I am in that wonderment. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question, Karuna. Uh, I want to ask everybody and especially Shabnam. It's seven fifteen now. Um, so. I think I'm okay with especially listening to the people whose hands have been raised for quite a while. It would be quite unfair and I'm quite happy to chat a little more and people if they are tiring are uh, free to drop out. But I would like to take these two, three questions oh. that oh. are here. Uh, so, so maybe, yeah, Bindu? Yes. So um... I just want to tell that uh, Deepa and uh, Radhika, I just consciously moved to the next question because there we, we can come back to Maya again. Um, just didn't want to not cover other things. So not that I wanted to deliberately ignore or anything. We'll come to that. And um, I think Aparna had her hands raised then. Shivangi and maybe I'm just I, I did have my hand raised, but uh, because of the time, I lowered it. But there are people ahead of me, let them go first. And if there is time, I will speak. Okay, who else was there? Sumit and Shireen. Okay, uh, hello, uh, thank you so much. I mean, I don't really have words to express uh, the feeling that I am going through right now. Uh, so my question was, uh, so I currently am working in a social sector and I got a chance to work with the tribal communities a couple of years back. And that was also a time when I kind of got reintroduced to Kabir. So my, so I got in a dilemma cause uh, even today you talked about, you know, letting go of the I or dropping my identity. But when I was working with tribal communities, I think. Uh, I felt that there is a need for them to assert their identity because in, in today's, you know, uh, broader scenario, their, their traditions, their every, everything is getting lost. So uh, I'm still uh, very confused at how, how can I find balance between it where 
it makes all sense to me that I should drop my identity. But then there are certain sections of the community or, or the society which need to assert their identities as well to, you know, maybe first identity, like assert their identity and then drop. So I, I don't know. I just want some your thoughts on this. Yes, uh, this is another very good question that does come up. And I guess this is the um, this is the kind of uh, uh, question that invites us to uh, search for jhina or subtle answers, or jhina and subtle practice. And uh, I cannot claim I have answers, and I cannot even claim that it would necessarily be easy, especially if you are working with communities for whom being dispossessed or disenfranchised by mainstream society like Dalits or women or poor people or tribal people, that it's going to be easy to find that balance and that rigor of self-questioning. But I would only say that uh, the tradition is replete with invocations of that space that is between ha and na. You know, Kabir will say, Mera Satguru ha or na ke beech mein samata hai. So it is not to dissolve and deny identity, but it is at all moments mm -hmm. to keep a window open, or as I like to say, wear the clothes of identity, but keep them a little loose fitting, thodi hawa ane do, kind of thing. You know, it's like a choga. Uh, if we straight jacket our identity so much by wearing this cloth that we never take off, then we are moving in the direction of delusion because really that's not all of who we are. And yes, I recognize the position of privilege from which I'm making such claims, right? Mm -hmm. If a Dalit were here, he would say, hello, thank you. You don't face the kind of oppression I do. I need to wear my Dalit identity if I have to get anywhere. And I recognize the problem of what I'm saying. But I also see how historically uh, clinging to an oppressed identity has not served the oppressed too well. Historically, we have seen how uh, deluded, oppressed identities have in turn become oppressive. Mm. So what is, the, uh, what is the way out? The way out is a rigor of, of self-interrogation at all moments. To deploy an identity when it is useful to even taste it, enjoy it, because particularity is the nature of life, of the human experience. One is not saying one becomes ether and dissolve identity. I, I, I revel in being a Punjabi. I, I delight in the language. I delight in the tastes of Punjabi food in all things culturally particular. But as Krishna Nathji in an interview on Ajab Sheher says, I also leap out of this identity ritually and regularly. I make the attempt and practice to touch an entity within myself, which is Nirgun. So, Nirgun Raja Pe Sirgun Sej Bichai. That is what you are being asked to appreciate. It is not saying that uh, the Raja doesn't need a sage. Of course he needs a sage, otherwise he would just vaporize into nothing. So uh, Kabir says in one Doha, Sagun ki seva karun, nirgun ka karun gyan, sagun nirgun dono pare taha rakhun dhyan. So it is not to put down our tribal identity, but not to be subsumed by it. So he is saying, I ser serve and love all, all sagun forms, all identities. But at all moments, I cultivate a knowledge 
of the formless, the nirgun, that which is beyond identity, that which is agam, akat, and the story is not over yet because you're still in a very dual framework right here okay sagun nirgun dono pare that place which is beyond this duality of form and formlessness that is where i bring my awareness to rest so it's it's like i feel it is a actually a misnomer to call Kabir a Nirgun poet. I believe Kabir is inviting us to constantly move between is and is not, between ha and na, between sagun and nirgun. He is inviting and insisting on a dynamic, moving sense of self, never, never at rest. So you create a house and then you burn it down like Bindu is talking about creating a Karnatic identity, classical identity, then breaking it down, creating another identity, breaking it down, creating another. That dynamism. To never feel this is who I am. To keep questing in another Doha, he says, Chalte Chalte Pag Thaka. Nagar raha no kos. Beach me hi dera dal diya phir kaho kon ka dosh. We all get tired of this. It's not easy, no, to keep doing this. We want to come and snuggle in a house. We don't want to burn it down. We don't want to take risks. We don't want to be exposed. We don't want to be vulnerable again. We want to rest on our laurels and achievements and say, I am a Carnatic classical expert or whatever. Mm -hmm. I am a so and so. So Kabir says, don't stop that journey. Don't do set up shop midway because the Nagar is still very far away. Thank you, Sumit, for that question. It's an important question. And I think I at some level, I just sometimes feel what I offer you is just clever talk. It's just good erudition. No, I'm saying this very humbly. Because it's not easy to do what you are doing. Because you're actually working with communities that mm -hmm. need to. And in some ways, this sajakta is called for by for all of us. But thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think Shireen has dropped out of the call. Um, so shall we take Aparna's question? Oh, hi. Oh, she's back. <laughs> I'm still around. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I saw Shireen left, it said. So yeah. I <laughs> no, so I had to log in from my mobile device because I have to, I've had to step out of the house. So it was just that transition. Um, so um, Shabnam ji, thank you very much. Um, for what you've been talking about. I just wanted to invite your comment on two things that I've been thinking of, of um, particularly the last piece that we learned, which, which was Uda Jayaga. And um, I'm sort of connecting it with that interview that you had with Linda Hess and how she talks about Kabir as, um, you know, as, as essential to breaking out of our fear of death and, um, and I think you also commented that Kabir is very, other people have told you that Kabir is really depressing um, because he's constantly talking about death and all of these things. But within the, the, that particular piece, Uda Jaiga, I just found a line of optimism. For me, that was optimism because he says, Jab hove, uh, umar puri. He doesn't say when life is over. He says when life is complete. Huh. So for me, that was a lot of optimism. So what does that, what does it mean? Perhaps it doesn't, there's something in that. And I'd want to invite your comment on that. And I also wanted to, I'm just being greedy here. Um, <laughs> the second comment that I wanted to invite you, uh, invite your uh, attention to is your film, Kabir Khada Bazaar Mein. And about 
the need for humans to deify um, Kabir and uh, how Kabir was very, very important to the Dalit community who were denied the access to God and how they made their own cult out of it and how Tepanyaji was trying to, within the Kabir Panti, trying to make change, but it just didn't happen. So perhaps Kabir is not meant to be institutionalized. Kabir is not meant as a, I don't know, like a, I, I guess, does it mean that you lose that spirit when things get institutionalized and when, you know, when, when people come together? So these are my two questions. I know we're running out of time. So uh, whatever works with the time we have. Well, I think these are all uh, wonderful questions, really, really insightful questions. And uh, I just want to thank you, Shireen, for this very beautiful Jina interpretation you have given to the term Puri. Uh, and uh, Urjaiga Hansakela is not a song I sing too often. I've heard it. So it's not something I have thought about too much. And I'm, I'm in wonderment at the beautiful spin you have given to the term Puri. So it's truly, truly beautiful what you have read. And I think it has unlocked that, uh, that line for me as well. Jab hove umar puri. Not end, but utterly, utterly full and complete, right? Jab chutega hukum hazuri. That's when you will be free. You will be free of that hukum hazuri, right? Jam ke doot bade mazboot, jam se pada jhamela. So in a sense, your spin on this has made us read death not as something that cuts off life, but death is something that releases you into life. You know, it's actually the opposite. It is not shutting things down. It's the confrontation with death is opening doors where they were closed otherwise. So thank you for that. I mean, I, I don't know what else I can say or add to what you have said. Um, the question of institutionalization, again, I feel uh, uh, a word of caution when we uh, valorize one thing, which in a sense, Linda and I am arguing with Prehladji in the film about, uh, where somewhere there is this mistrust of structure, institution, but I would invite us to also reflect on that in the same light as the conversation that just went, which is that institutions are also, in a sense, sagun. Uh, they are also collective identities uh, and they are valuable forms that, that mobilize sentiment, emotion, meaning, meaning making, uh, validation of uh, one's social needs, uh, Rituals are very, very uh, sagun, okay? Rituals are not always and only exploitative or oppressive. Rituals are uh, uh, place markers for something we hold valuable in our lives. They are uh, ritual reminders, ritual reminders of that which we cherish. If we keep the sense of wonderment, thank you, you've really brought the right word to this whole evening. If we keep that sense of wonderment and that freshness alive when we even partake of ritual rather than do it in a mechanical way and worse, doing it in a way that exploits other people uh, as has happened in many situations, then all these sagun forms, whether institutions or rituals or sanghas or collectives or identities that emerge from collective brands of any kind, they are all deploying valuable purpose and meaning for all of us. We just again have to be sajag, we have to be alert when those institutions and those collective ideas begin to get corrupted, mechanical, when they lose their sense of wonder, authenticity, agency, as they invariably do. So I think uh, even with institutions, I would say think 
you know, they should be born and then they should die. You know, we should cultivate the art of celebrating death. You know, institutions should be born because there is an energy that makes them happen in history. There is a collective impulse that is propelling the creation of certain uh, institutions. But then they should die. They should celebrate their own death. They should carry that chabi of that tala in their pockets, but they never do. They will keep flogging that dead horse and all of that will happen. So, thank you, Shireen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I think maybe you'll take Aparna's question and then with that. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi, Shabnam. Hi, hi. Uh, Bindu and everyone. I uh, recently heard you, Shabnam, in Bangalore when you performed at uh, the Good Earth community. Ah. And, uh, that was uh, wonderful. I um, just want to share something that, um, you know, I just heard very recently and it has deeply impacted me. I was recently at a Kabir retreat and um, <clears throat> there was a song which was sung um, called, I'll just say the words, Manare Thir Raho, Mat Kath Jai Jiyo. I mean, I, I just jotted this uh, a song down as I was listening. So maybe I've got some uh, words wrong. Manare thir raho, mat kat jai jiyo, bahar tundat, bohat dukh pava, kar amrit kat, mahe jiyo. Here, <coughs> kar means us, the body, uh, and amrit kat, kat is the riday, we were told. Kar amrit kat, mahe jiyo. And then there is one dialogue between uh, Namdev ji and uh, Trilochan ji. And uh, that is being put into Shabbat by uh, Kabir. Which is, you know, um, Na uh, Namdev ji was a printer. Uh, you know, he used to uh, do block printing on fabric. So, uh, Trilochan is uh, telling uh, Namdev that, you know, Nama Maya Moya Kahe Trilochan Meet Kahe Chipehe Chapie Ram Nalaoji. So he's saying that you are now, I'm not sure whether I'm getting the words right. Ram Nalaoji? What? Uh, basically, to say that you know, why are, you are caught up in uh, your work, you are just printing day in and day, day in and out, and you have forgotten Ram. And to that, uh, Trilochan is uh, replying, saying that Nama kahe, O Trilochana, Mukhte Ram Samal, Haat Pao Kar Kam Sab, Chit Niranjana. So he's saying that, you know, my hands and my legs are occupied in daily work, but my chit is, you know, uh, concentrating or is devoted to the Niranjan and uh, this song the way it was sung the way it was uh, explained has deeply impacted uh, me um, and also in continuation to the Maya discussion that uh, the, the Maya about Maya what you were speaking Shabnam that you know uh, Maya is also um, you know we may be whatever we are doing in a daily day to day life it's a sagun thing that you know uh, it's it is uh, it is it has a texture it is tactile you can feel it and it's living and uh, we are experiencing day in and day out but you know and that's that's also that's also like a, uh, like an aid it is helping us it is serving us in a way it is not it's not the dark witch necessarily uh, it is serving us, showing us the, the the higher way probably. But also here he says that, you know, Haat pao kar kaam sab chit niranjan nal. So, Shabnam, like you said that Pralaji is doha that, you know, 
uh, whatever grips your mind right now is maya so fun question if my if i am gripped by niranjan right now is niranjan maya yes that <laughs> is why the last doha i shared yeah. invited you to go beyond anjan and niranjan it invites you to go beyond sagun and nirgun beyond that which is anjan and beyond that which is niranjan you find this a lot in kabir in if you look at the oeuvre of kabir overall you will find in some poems he will tell you to do gyan dhyan jap tap he will tell you to uh, focus on the breath and then in other bhajans he will say is sab se kuch nahi hoga pach pach mar gaye karte karte gyani dhyani yogi tap tapi what does he mean is this a error i think he means this he means okay. that when you recognize the anjan and you discover the niranjan it is authentic it is wonderful it is in the authentic now present moment of discovery that you discover the niranjan and then it becomes mechanical it becomes a source of identity it becomes a source of memory it becomes a source of hum niranjani hain hum niranjan panth ke log hain Mm-hmm. that's just one example of how it becomes mechanical it becomes a stale truth so he says drop the niranjan too and go to a place which is neither anjan nor niranjan so these are two moments in the same journey and two moments of the same sadhana where you recognize that your niranjan has now become anjan yes so you need to discover a fresh niranjan yet again yes Yes. So when you are, your mind is getting obsessed with Niranjan, that is the Anjanification of Niranjan. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you so much, Shabnam. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful questions. Really nuanced. Uh, it was a beautiful poem that you shared. Uh, I've learned so much talking to all of you. um really really nice thank you bindu for making this evening possible bindu i'm sorry to interrupt but there were two questions in the chat radhika yeah. yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> radhika's <laughs> question is there she's making some, sure and someone that before doesn't... me also someone before me also who had who had no no uh, radhika i did mention that i have i i carefully went past it because we had had a long um, conversation on maya so we'll go back to other things and then come back to that sure. is what happened sure. so it's um the questions are there but uh, shabnam where does where does looking beyond oneself and selfless care for others figure in maya i'm not sure i understand this question fully so if uh, deepa is here would you like to uh, expand a little bit on this question or if she has left are you I here think she's think, left. Uh, she has left so the radhika oh, i think i said. see a deepa here maybe not the same yeah thing. yeah so i think i couldn't uh, unmute myself so i I'm just uh, i mean it's a small piece which i feel that uh, i don't know if it is really related to maya but uh, in life we are always talk- thinking about ourselves in which way in the terms of kabir or otherwise but uh, that to me is instinctive even animals do that as humans um does kabir's philosophy touch that if we are humans and a higher evolved species should we not think about caring for others in a way which is self completely selfless which as humans we tend to be never able to do that yes absolutely deepa there is so much of this in the kabir tradition mm-hmm. bar bar this uh, this uh, invocation to the manakh janam manakh as in manushya janam a manakh janam duhelo hai that this uh, is a very precious opportunity to rise above the animal realm uh, it is it is our capacity to rise beyond a self grasping uh ignorance to use a buddhist term uh this self cherishingness 
uh, is what animals also have, you know. So, but unfortunately, most of humankind, 99% of us are just pissing on our territories like, <laughs> like animals do. Uh, essentially, that's what the human drama is about. Uh, it is really not a going much beyond that realm. So there is a lot of reference in the Kabir tradition to the capacity for daya, compassion, uh, to knowing, preet karo to yun karo, jaise lota door, gala phasave apna, pani piye koi aur. Such a beautiful image to, to express that true love is that which goes beyond the self beyond self-regard and uh, last question from Radhika thank you for this question Deepa uh, can you talk a little bit about the verses in Matkar Maya Ko Ehenkar like your slideshow the verses also move from obvious to more layers especially the last verse about how Mukti is also not reliable yes Radhika that's such a uh, nice way of putting it that it does go deeper and deeper and deeper to subtler and subtler in fact um, the antra that speaks of uh, okay let's look at the first antra which says uh, fame and glory and power and kingdoms of the sakt maharaj yes of course that is going to go the jhulta hati is going to go very very obvious uh, and then to the nature of life itself which is like as fragile as a fl flickering flame uh, in a in an oil lamp in a camel skin oil lamp Sindhara. to self grasping ignorance <clears throat> ah, ha, ha, ha. lal me ka lal tera kon kya hawal you know that oh you think you are so precious oh you think you are such a lal such a beloved such a jewel such a you are so important i mean if you it, it's staggering sometimes that insight how important we think we are you know sometimes it hits you like you're crazy to think you're so important so uh, that is maya and then this very interesting subtle insight about uh, bereavement uh, where even within that antra there are layers your mai, your bap are all maya. Your relationships that you think and you take so much for granted are maya. They are not permanent. And then within that kunta chhati, even when they go, even the bereavement is impermanent. It is only of that moment and going, going. And finally, ending with this thing that we might valorize, which is enlightenment itself, which is the gift of the Guru, the Mukti. Uh, I mean, we've seen enough Gurus who lost their way, haven't we? All around us, we see Gurus who've lost the path. And uh, I think there are many who we can recognize from their teachings in early parts of their journey which still speak to us and then we can ignore the the corruptions and the excesses that followed later because even gurus are uh, impermanent and the mukti they receive in the moments of insight uh, can be lost will be lost unless it's refreshed thank you thank you all right. Thank you so much, Shabnam. Um, this, uh, no, I'm, I'm really at a loss for words, but just really, really deeply grateful for all that you have shared and um, for all the time that you have given us. And I, I, I thank everybody here to have, you know, asked such beautiful nuanced questions. And um, it's really made this whole session that much more um, brighter. Absolutely. Sparkling. <laughs> so um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
yes, I if another day I'll ask you to sing <laughs> because yeah, I think I it's a long day. It's quite yes. it's been a while. Yes. Thank you, yes. Teju. So nice to see you again after all these years. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you bye so bye much. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.